Welcome, uh, and I thank you all uh, for coming. Uh, I'm uh, Sats Rubris, I'm the Director of the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. And uh, as a colleague, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences and uh, the Dean of the Graduate School, Carlos Alonso, for taking this initiative of, on behalf of the students to invite here one of the most provocative uh, thinkers of our time, yeah, yeah. Elvis Slavoj Zizek. Yes, yes. Uh, you, you actually get it, that, definitely. <laughs> uh, well, you know, as you see, I've been asked to, uh, to serve as a moderator for today's gathering, and uh, you understand that moderating Zizek is an impossible event. Uh, and given the historical situation, and the subject, partly the subject, what we're going to talk about, uh, to have a Greek ask, uh, acting as the uh, uh, agent of moderation as well. I don't know. <laughs> what's, what's beyond the impossible, uh, Slavoj? Um, it is indeed a great uh, and personal uh, pleasure uh, uh, to welcome Slavoj Žižek, a dear friend whom I've known for more than 20 years and whose work has always been inspiring to me since my earliest uh, uh, writings. Now uh, although we don't late, late all, phase. Yeah, when we, yes, uh, although we don't always agree, uh, as uh, of course uh, is also known, uh, I'll get to these points of agreement and disagreement when it's my turn uh, to speak. But let me just say that even in disagreement, uh, an encounter with uh, Slavoj's uh, thought is always eye-opening and, and in ways that are uh, often uh, quite unexpected. Uh, Slavoj Žižek, as you all know, is a great uh, polemical thinker in the best sense of that word, uh, which I think restores uh, philosophy's earliest uh, dimensions as a political art, uh, as an unsettling, troubling uh, art in the sphere of public contention. That is, before philosophy became uh, a vehicle for personal and solitary contemplation, an art of comfort, as it were. So in this sense, uh, Slavoj's thought deliberately provokes disagreement. In fact, he hates the culture of agreement, as he'll tell us several times, and rightfully so, uh, given its legacy as a mechanism of appeasement and depoliticization, certainly in the society that we live in. Uh, Slavoj writes about everything and at superhuman speed and scale. So to list all his works uh, here would be, I think, a disservice, uh, for it would take time away from the real thing. Uh, but since uh, the convention demands it, let me name in entirely arbitrary and totally self-centered uh, fashion the works I value the most, uh, not because I necessarily agree with them. Uh, the Sublime Object of Ideology, which I think is a sublime book to which we all must periodically return. Um, uh, tearing with a negative, the indivisible remainder, the ticklish subject. These works are uh, uh, essentially philosophical works of an extraordinary kind. Uh, one of the things I admire uh, about Slavoj's thinking particularly, I'm, I'm talking about myself, self-centered in this way, is his thinking uh, of, of Hegel and on Hegel, uh, I think restoring uh, or perhaps even uh, creating in the best sense again, uh, the radicalness of Hegelian <coughs> thinking against a lot of, uh, I think, fashionable simplifications. I go on, uh, The Puppet and the, the Dwarf and the Fragile Absolute, these two books are the books on Christianity, with which I disagree rather profoundly. Uh, then uh, first, uh, uh, As Tragedy, then As Farce, and a small volume that, uh, that followed it uh, called Violence. These books are really central to our discussion today. Um, and more recently, three books in defense of lost causes, Living in the End of Times, and now the year of dreaming uh, dangerously, the publication of which has brought us uh, here today. Again, as I mentioned, uh, uh, this uh, uh, doesn't even measure the fourth of uh, Slavoj Žižek's total work, but as I said, uh, we have Slavoj live here, so we'll get on with it. Uh, we have a very simple procedure. Uh, Slavoj will speak uh, for half an hour, right? Then uh, my dear colleagues here, Bruce Robbins, who is the uh, Old Dominion Professor in the Humanities in uh, Department of English and Comparative Literature, will speak first. Professor Lydia Liu, uh, Hun Tsun Tam, Professor of East Asian Languages and uh, also Comparative Literature in Society, will speak next. And uh, I will speak after uh, for uh, no more than 10 minutes, 15 max. As I say, I, I have the impossible task of moderating. I'll try to do the best I can. Uh, and then the floor will be open. Uh, or Slavoj will, of course, feel free to uh, a protest uh, 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 or whatever we have to say or, or uh, 
find uh, interesting things to say about it, and then we can certainly open it up for questions, which is really what why we're here for. So, Slavoj, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Proud to be here. Let's see what will happen. Uh, I am basically, in the last years already, returning to philosophy. I'm less and less, frankly, interested in all this political stuff, although my book somehow appear not mm -hmm. clear to me how. So I would nonetheless, I mean, the book is the book, your judgment. So I don't want to give some general introduction or uh, I, had, I had the cover, but that's another story. Uh, 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 I want to do something else. I want to make just a couple of short five-minute interventions. First one, a little bit longer, about a methodological question of classification, which could have been subtitled in praise of chimney sweepers. If you know Kierkegaard, you know what I mean. Uh, and then a couple of, well, as you would have put it, provocative, consciously problematic points, which will also concern violence. So, uh, let me begin. It may appear difficult, you know, it's usual to say we don't need that cl mechanic classification, but a living thought. Nonetheless, one should ask, how does a thought which is really living, not in any irrational sense, but in more Hegelian sense, how does it affect classifications. In other words, if we really want to think critically, what, what do we do with classifications? By classifications, I simply mean subdivisions, categorizations, like political space, left, right, or ruling class, uh, exploited class, whatever. I think that here, in a strange way, the three great post-Hegelians, okay, the third one is more a poet, but nonetheless, to, uh, Kierkegaard, Marx, and Heinrich Heine come together. They do the same thing. First, Kierkegaard, my God, if you have a minimum of, now I'm consciously Eurocentric elitist of uh, education, you know what I'm referring to, referring to. There is, in Kierkegaard, I think, fear and trembling. Uh, sorry, I hope this, yeah. A wonderful passage where Kierkegaard proposes the subdivision of entire humanity into three categories. If you are human, you have to be one of these three. Quote, a wit has said that one might divide mankind into officers, serving maids, and chimney sweepers. To my mind, this remark is not only witty but profound, and it would require a great speculative talent to devise a better classification, and so on and so on. So, the first insight is this classification has an immediate social but also sexual foundation. It's not as crazy as it appears, because officer stands for uh, uh, assertive, military, manliness, and so on, and uh, uh, serving mate is the model of a servant, subordinated woman. Now, of course, the point is, what does the chimney sweeper do here? Why he has to be added? Because I think this would be my formula of critical thought. Don't forget the chimney sweeper. Why? Let's look to Marx. Marx does something similar when, even two times, first, both times in Capital, in the first chapter, no, sorry, this one is not the first chapter, it's later in Capital, when Marx describes the market exchange between worker and, workers and capitalists as, I quote, the very Eden paradise of the innate rights of men. There alone rule freedom, equality, property, and bentham. That's Marx. No, on, on market we are all equal, free, blah, blah, and bentham. That's the chimney sweeper element here. I think that one should, uh, nonetheless, maybe correct here, Mans, I think the formula would have worked much better with just three elements, freedom, equality, and bentham. Why? Because Bentham is for Marx, as he says, uh, 
the name Bentham stands for the fact that, I quote again, the only force that brings them, people on the market, together and puts them in the relation with each other is the selfishness, the private interest of each of them, and so on and so on. So, of course, the original triad is uh, freedom, equality, fraternity. Fraternity gets, to use Lacan's term, suppressed, repressed, verdrängt, replaced with uh, Bentham. Then there is another weird classification by Marx when he introduces the topic of general equivalent. He writes, again, towards the end of the first chapter of Capital, I quote, it is, when we are dealing with general equivalent, ultimately money, it is as if alongside and external to lions, tigers, rabbits, and all others, actual animals which form, when grouped together, the various kinds, species, subspecies, families, and so on, of the animal kingdom, it is as if, uh, alongside all this, there existed in addition the animal, the individual incarnation of the entire animal kingdom. And I think, again, this is the logic, and we should strictly read together, I think, the two paradoxes of classification by, uh, by uh, Marx, or to go, or maybe we can even, so that you will see what I'm aiming at, improvise other cases, like let's take social division. It's not enough to say we have, I don't know, to simplify it, of course, uh, capitalists and workers. In order for society to function, ideologically, of course, you need a chimney sweeper. That's, for example, the logic of anti-Semitism. No, it's capitalists, workers, and Jews. The idea being, if you erase the Jew, then you would have beautiful subdivision harmony. Everyone at his or their own place. The Jews comes, introduces chaos or whatever. Or, uh, 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 I think the same paradoxical category in Hegel is rebel. So you ha we have all the Stände, the estates, and then rebel. Rebel as the excessive element which designates those who, as our friend who cannot be here, sadly, at the Bar would have put it, no, rebel is uh, uh, the element which is formally part of the social edifice, but doesn't have a proper place within it. Or, as Jacques Rancière puts it, uh, la part du non part, the part with no part within it. Now, uh, what Hegel knew but didn't always recognize and failed to recognize precisely apropos rebel, is that precisely this excessive part, almost excremental, stands for universality as such. Uh, so, uh, back to Marx. You know, when Marx speaks about Bentham, we should be very careful not to misread this along the lines of a similar classification by Heinrich Heine, where he said that, and I think this is the bad Heine, because of which Marx didn't like Heine towards the end of Heine's life. Namely, Heine said somewhere that every normal German, he meant it positively, should value above everything else freedom, equality, and crab soup. Crab soup, of course, stands for, and this is why I hate it, that, you know, a, uh, as liberals would have put it against totalitarians, don't focus only on the big ideals. Show understanding for small human pleasures, weaknesses. If you are too fanatical, if you forget about crepe soup or what crepe soup stands for, you end up as some Robespierre or Jacobin totalitarian and so on. It's in a way, you know, like, don't... It's okay to have ideals, but be realist, small weaknesses, small pleasures. But I think this is precisely the wrong reading. Because the excessive element, Bentham, does not stand for this kind of a human common sense, but on the contrary, it stands for the 
excessive element which in a way colorizes, provides a mode, a tone, a, the color for the entire totality. That is to say, for Marx, Bentham is not just a comical addition. Bentham means, yeah, yeah, we have uh, equality, legal order, freedom, but Bentham says retroactively what all the big categories effectively mean in a bourgeois society. Bentham, precisely as this ridiculous excess, is the, uh, is the uh, totalizing moment. So again, uh, this would be, that I don't lose time, my first conclusion, like, uh, don't forget the chimney sweeper. And this, the chimney sweeper, that's true now, does not mean be human, take bear in mind the plurality, you cannot be dogmatic. No, the chimney sweeper, this excessive element, doesn't stand for the empirical surplus over the big difference. Like, we have workers and capitalists, but society is not as simple as that. There are always others. Marge. No, uh, this excessive element stands precisely for the difference as such. I will try to explain this through the logic very briefly of anti-Semitism. Uh, you know what's the paradox of, for example, maybe you are too young, but maybe if you remember once there was a time when we talked about left and right in politics, no? <laughs> and this is a nice example of what Marx called, of, of what uh, Lacan or my ex-friend Ernesto Laclau would have called antagonistic relationship, where in a paradoxical way the difference precedes what it is the difference of. This may appear a cheap paradox, but again, let me explain it through left and right, politically. The distinction between left and right is not only a distinction of the political space into two blocks. It's a different logic of the entire political space. If you ask a right-winger how does he perceive the entire social body, he would have given you probably a different articulation than the left-winger, usually, traditionally. The right-winger would be more organistic. He would say, first, I am not a right-winger. I am stable center, and all others are extremist destabilizing. <laughs> While a left-winger would have said, no, society as such is characterized by a central antagonism, and so on and so on. But so you see the logic. This is what... Lacan would have meant by difference not as a simply symbolic differential, but as real. That it's not that we have workers, capitalists, they fight. They fight for their very difference, for what their difference means. There is no neutral notion of society where you can distinguish, naively, workers and capitalists, which would be independent of, of you taking side, being engaged. Uh, in the struggle. And my point is that, uh, for example, in anti-Semitism, the Jew is not just the empirical complication. It stands for this antagonism as such. Because as you know, if you know minimally about, minimal about fascism there, as they make it clear, without the Jew, which of course stands for social antagonism, those plot, uh, we wouldn't have class struggle. We would have, that's the Nazi ideal, a social harmony between different parts, everyone at his or their own place, or as they told me when I was in China, not our friend Van Kui, but some others. You know, I had a wonderful experience in Shanghai, I remember. They told me, but we no longer talk about communism here. We talk about a harmonious society, this Confucian bullshit. Okay. So I asked them, cut the crap. What do you mean by it? And they gave me a, they told me in a harmonious society, everyone is as his, her, or their proper place. Leader is a good reader, worker a good worker, teacher a good teacher, wife a good wife, and so on. And I exploded. I said, this is wonderful. We no longer have all those problems of multicultural understanding. In Europe, we call this corporate fascism. What's the problem? And so on. We understand. So, uh, but no, you see the point how you need the Jew. By Jew, I mean the antagonistic tension which fascism uh, projects onto the Jew. Jew as a 
fantasy image of anti-Semites, of course. You need the Jew to, you need uh, the figure of the Jew for the relationship to become uh, antagonistic. Okay, my first point. My second point, now to complicate things a little bit. <laughs> Nothing to do with the first one. <laughs> uh, you know, the Germans have this wonderful expression, rigganging machen, which is usually translated with to annul, to cans, to unhitch. But I think it would be much nicer to read it as undoing, retroactively annihilating. Now, I'm not bullshitting. I think that our times are precisely the times of such an undoing of emancipatory achievements. And I mean this at every at a very elementary level. How, uh, how do I mean it? First, to give you an idea, I love classical music. I can't really, You know who would be the pure opera composer of undoing? Rossini. Uh, compare Mozart's Le Noce di Figaro and Rossini's Barber of Sevilla. Mozart is politicized. You remember in, in Don Giovanni, that big entry of Don Giovanni, Viva la Libertà and everyone. While the whole, this is why Rossini stopped composing after 1830, counter-revolution. The whole dream of Rossini is, let's pretend that there was no French Revolution. We can simply return, you know, Rossini's uh, Figaro is not that su potentially subversive Figaro of Beaumarchais and Mozart. It's a kind of a, this pre-modern, pre-revolutionary topic of a tricky servant playing with the master or whatever, and so on and so on. So uh, who would be then today's uh, Rossini? Uh, first, I think it's all around Europe. I'm tired of America bashing. I'm going back to Europe where, apropos Greece, even in northern, you know, what I'm trying to impart to you is this weird feeling, and I want to praise dogmaticism now. I think we, the left, should celebrate dogmaticism. What do I mean by this? That, uh, in a good sense, dogmaticism. It's that I think sometimes dogmaticism is even one of the best indicators of, if I may use this term, progress. What do I mean by this? Imagine a society where we would have to argue all the time should women, should we allow women to be raped or not? And you, no, sorry, I would like to live in a society where if someone advocates, you know, all the bullshit, women secretly like it, they are just hypocritical, blah, blah, blah. You don't argue. The guy simply appears as an eccentric jerk or whatever. It's to such an extent our second nature to accept this. And this is what makes me sad today, at least in Europe. Statements, emancipatory achievements in racism, anti-feminism, and so on, which had the status of this type of self-evident dogma. You simply accept it, like we don't torture people, women are equal, no racism, and so on. It's no longer so self-evident. They are gently, gently returning in post-communist Eastern Europe, even in celebrated Scandinavian countries, and so on and so on. I think this is a phenomenon which should worry us very much. Or, at the level of political and social logic, how imperceptibly the achievements which made certain rights, simple rights, are reinterpreted as Privileges. This is a nice symptom. A friend just emailed me from England that now, very recently, the British government, conservative, issued an order that in all legal or state proclamations documents, you no longer use the term unemployed. You use the term workless. And of course, the gain is clear. First, workless gently resonate with worthless, without, you know, like... <laughs> Point two, if you say unemployed, the implication is that you would like to work, you just cannot get employment. No. If you say workless, it pushes you imperceptibly towards Greece, you know. Uh, <laughs> sorry, my joke. You know what I mean? Like, lazy people who, 
No, as I call to my friends to annoy them, this is not racism, this is cultural anthropology, what I'm doing now. No, sorry, quite, uh, uh, quite seriously. Uh, you know what is my defense? Would you agree? I don't know if I use this, that uh, when you Greeks, which is, of course, false, I even once engaged in a very vulgar geopolitical logic. It's so primitive, but I, when we hear all this bullshit, you know, you Greeks, lazy, and so on. Listen, I'm ashamed to say this, but maybe there are countries where nature, too much fruit falling down, makes you <laughs> lazy. Yeah, but you are not this. But you have this, but you have, what do you mean? You know, you have this uh, uh, mountainous area. We, it's, even following this very vulgar logic, you are not lazy, but my great... <laughs> No, no, no. My main point is the following one. I know that this is the wrong topic. That's my point. That, uh, in the same way as the moment you accept, for example, debating a Nazi, that, that anti-Semitism is about real properties of Jews, and then you start arguing, no, but you are wrong. Jews are not really like that. You've sold your soul to the devil, I claim. Because, you know, the point of anti-Semitism that we should analyze, it's not. Let's look at it, are Jews really like that? This doesn't matter. The point is, why does the Nazi subject need the figure of the Jew to bring together, to hold together his entire political edifice? I would like to apply now to this Lacan's well-known slogan that, about jealous husband, that even if all his reproaches to the wife that she is sleeping around with other men are true. His jealousy is nonetheless pathological. <laughs> so again, uh, okay, let me slowly conclude. You know who would be another clear case of this regression here? I was quite shocked. You know what now, three months ago, Viktor Orban, the Hungarian prime minister, you know what he said? He said that Hungary will probably have to invent, I quote, a new type of political system instead of democracy. He says, cooperation is a question of force, not of intention. Perhaps there are countries where things can work that way. For example, in Scandinavia, but such a half Asiatic, ragtag people as we Hungarians are, can unite only if there is force. I found this wonderful. I remember in 56, when Soviet tanks were advancing on Budapest, the most famous quoted by all liberals with, with tears and intellectual <laughs> orgasm are the famous telegram, you know, saying to the West when Russian tanks advanced, we are defending Europe here. Now we have a guy who presents himself as the ultimate radical successor of these dissidents and who all of a sudden claim, no, no, we are not Europe, we are Asiatic, and so on. Isn't this a strange era where the term Asiatic rectech people is used as a positive uh, <laughs> signation, and so on, so quickly. I, you have time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 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 my next point would have been critical. I hope it's made clearly enough in the book uh, that many French political theorists from... Balibar, my friend, I'm proud to say, Etienne Balibar is here not the worst. Rancière and Badiou, I'm more critical with them. I don't like their obsession with uh, state power. It is as if, you know, state is the enemy, and you have here all this Deleuzean uh, uh, undercurrent. State is representation we need immediately self-transparent presentation, local democracy or whatever. And then the idea is, let me quote, uh, uh, I think it is uh, 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 one of the, uh, Gianni Vatimo, who said, we have to be outside. This is a postmodern idea. The idea is that I must subtract myself from the game of power. I claim that if there is a lesson from the ongoing economic crisis, is that, no, we should not exactly rehabilitate state power, but see that the fundamental struggle is not in this Deleuzean, Badiouian way, I know they're not the same, consciously I put them together, of big state apparatus there, the enemy, no, I'm here a Marxist. The big struggle is 
the struggle about capitalism, which is precisely in society, which is why, ironically, if you say, oh, the state, we should withdraw, gain a distance at the state, well, Rick Santorum would certainly applaud, applaud to this. No, the point today is, okay, in the long term, abolish the state, but are there ways today to use the state? with all contradictions that this involves. This is why, sincerely, I'm not lying here, uh, I sincerely admired Syriza in Greece, because they were not afraid to take the risk of, if God helped, it didn't help them, uh, uh, take power. You know, it's so comfortable to enjoy this position of distance and, uh, you know, and then this you follow the greatest tradition of Marxism of the 20th century, which is, did you notice this sad fact that all the greatest Marxist books of the 20th century, historical, are very convincing explanation of why a defeat had to happen. Marxists were always the best of like Trotsky on Stalin and so on and so on. So that would be my first point. Maybe it's time to refocus from this. Now I will be even evil and put all of them together. Uh, Judith Butler, but you, I know they hate each other. Uh, right? You know, this idea, state centralized, regularized, marginal resistances, and so on and so on. No, again, the, the conflict is within society. Uh, second thing. Uh, I'm approaching the end, but just another, maybe even stronger provocation. Uh, uh, I think that also what concerning uh, universality, I think, and post-colonialism. Now, I wonder if you will swallow this. When I was in India, I got, as I always do, I got involved in polemics with their Brahmin elite, you know, who are all for justice, but then you mention what about castes and untouchables, what about equality, and you are immediately accused of uh, ideological imperialism, you want to impose on us these Western values and so on. And uh, one of them said, now comes a nice ideological point, for me at least. One of them told me, but are you aware that we are here already formally debating with you in an underprivileged position? We Indians, a great nation, even to make our point, we are compelled to speak in an imposed language of the colonizer. So even to assert ourselves, we have to assume the form of the opponent and so on and so on. Well, first I gently reminded them that English is also not my. Typically, they <laughs> overlook that. Like, you know, me from a small shitty nation, two million, it's not a problem. Big India, of course. But I tried to make another point which didn't pass well there. That now I come to Hegel, my big love. <laughs> I agree the imposition of English towards posits an obstacle to whatever this means, let's call it hypothetically authentic Indian spirit in Hegelian terms. But I claim something else, that it is only through this imposition of foreign language, through the loss of their authentic being, that this authentic being emerged. If you take away the English language, you, not get, you don't get authentic India. You get the bullshit of local cultures, blah, 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 whatever, which is not what emancipatory post-colonial Indians are fighting for. And that's the beautiful Hegelian point made in a wonderful way by Hegel already apropos Christianity. Hegel says that the originality of Christianity is not God is even better. No, it's the fall. It's that Hegel says clearly, the fall, okay, but what is the fall? Fall, Adam, screwing, and so on. What is the fall, the fall from? That X, spiritual purity, emerges only through the fall. Before the fall, paradise is stupid animality, and so on. So, you see, this is Hegel's logic. Forget about all that bullshit, which then is to be deconstructed. You have an immediacy, which is alienated, fall. No, at the beginning, it's not immediacy. It's just a confused multitude. Then you have the fall, and the fall retroactively generates the specter of what it is the fall from. 
So it's a much more, uh, uh, a much more complex logic here. So uh, now, uh, uh, just surprise, really, to conclude, my <laughs> last point, and here I will try to provoke all of you. Uh, I think that uh, I have quotes on the last two pages of the book, but due to some editing mistake, I was pissed off because of this, the references disappeared. T.J. Clark, the well-known uh, uh, art theorist who incidentally did a wonderful piece on, on, on uh, uh, Jean-Louis David's The Death of Marat as the first modernist painting, uh, he published a text in, a couple of months ago in New Left Review where he says something very simple, but I think there is a grain of truth in it, that uh, basically whatever remained of radical left in the last decades was playing the game of patience, patience. Okay, we live in apparent prosperity, but the time will come when there will be crisis and then our moment. Okay, now the crisis is here and protests, whatever. I don't see any, even I know we cannot propose a detailed program now or whatever, but at least a vague general vision of what the left wants. Correct me if I'm wrong. I was, I'm asking them, not demanding some ridiculous, what would be your first law, your second law, but very basic questions like, do you want capitalism, just capitalism, what I ironically refer to, capitalism with a human face, in the same way that uh, once we wanted so like, you know, this Keynesian stuff, you know, more health care, more education, and so on, or do you want to move beyond? If you want to move beyond what? Some kind of a nationalization, democratic nation state, or some kind of, or even this eternal dream, which I think has absolutely to be abandoned, of immediate transparency democracy, you know, this negri, hard multitude, local communities, pre-representation, they work, and so on, and so on. What do you want? It's in interesting how uh, you get either very general ideas, like, my God, people are telling me we want uh, uh, money to serve people, not people to serve money. Well, Thanks, Hitler would have agreed with it. Because money which doesn't own, uh, serve people is owned by the Jews and so on, you know. So, no, I'm not uh, blaming these leftists and so on. I'm saying that the problem is serious. And then precisely now, when there is a movement like with Syriza and so on, mm -hmm. my God, you know, like my otherwise friend Kostas Duzinas from London, attacked me, I claim, in a typical Marxist way of two stages. He said, no, Slavoj, now we are in a stage of revolt. Next will be the stage of construction of the new. You are asking questions too early, and now this serves the enemy, no? But then I told him, because I was there, this was one week before Syriza elections. I was said, so what? I should wait one week or whatever, you know? <laughs> like, what I think is that maybe we have to start to think, to offer something when we have explosions of unrest. Of course, not simple formulas, uh, nationalized, whatever, but nonetheless, these basic questions, and I very open here, non-dogmatic, you know, like, is capitalism here to stay? Can we imagine a move beyond capitalism? In what sense? I think we can and should, because if you ask me, look at the mess with intellectual property. It's in the long term the ruin of capitalism. Look at ecology. If we don't invent some kind of a, even transnational global collective action, we are doomed and so on. How to do it and so on. I think it's the time to drop, this is why, as a pure irony, I really wanted to, two years ago, when there was that big guy, Bernard Madoff, or what, you know, uh, to write, uh, uh, to celebrate him. No, I'm not crazy, but saying how false it was, he was the ideal victim. Instead of questioning the system, you had there, oh, the, look, the greedy, my God, bankers were always greedy. The problem is what changed in the system that they were able to realize their greediness. So again, it's a very modest conclusion that ideological struggle is going on more 
than ever. This new common, the fact that we cannot imagine alternatives is in itself a sign of ideological victory of opponents. Here we have nothing to envy China. I mentioned in one of my books, conclusion, I promise, that uh, in China, half a year ago, friends told me, my God, but I have here a friend, is it true or not? Uh, friends did tell me this, that the Chinese authorities passed a law basically prohibiting topics of time travel and alternate history in narrative media. I claim this is a great thing. You know why? Because if it's true. Uh, because uh, <laughs> at least those authorities are afraid that, you know, if you play with alternate histories, this, of course, gives you an idea how things might be different, you know. The point is that this is a good sign in the sense that those in power are still at least afraid of people's imagination. With us, there is no prohibition needed because we cannot even imagine it. As Fred Jameson put long ago, it's much easier for us to imagine Armageddon. We, every month we have a new novel or movie about, you know, asteroid hitting the Earth, whatever. The end of life on, of Earth, nothing more self-evident. A small change in capitalism, impossible. <laughs> this is ideology in practice. So just I'm saying, you know, the moment is dangerous, and the very reasons on account of which I'm a pessimist, I'm also a little bit an optimist. As I say in the book, the true utopia today is the utopia that things can go on indefinitely the way they are, you know. Oh, this is all I'm saying. My communism is not, oh, Comrade Stalin, come back. My communism is this. Uh, capitalism is not devil. I'm here a Marxist. It's arguably the most dynamic system in the history of humanity. But strange things are happening with capitalism today. In some countries, China, Singapore, we have capitalism which is even more dynamic than our Western capitalism, but it obviously doesn't need too much of democracy. So I claim there is a divorce on the horizon in this eternal marriage between capitalism and democracy. We are approaching a zero point, ecology and so on. Things cannot go on the way they do. So this is all my Marxism. It's basically anti-Fukuyama. But wait a minute, Fukuyama is a half-honest half conservative. He himself, the last time I met him, told me he's no longer a Fukuyamaist. <laughs> no, 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 he's honest conservative. He told me, why are you looking at that machine? We are living people, not machines here. You know? He has no, there's nothing on it. Ah, the, 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 the void, yeah. No, sorry, quite seriously. I, you know, for me, the true dilemma today is, are we Fukuyamaists? Which means, Liberal democratic capitalism is the ultimate frame. We can make it more Keynesian, more blah, blah, but we remain, or should we begin to ask more radical questions? I think, A, we should, but B, that's why I'm not a conservative, not in the sense of return to some past tradition. We should go through this zero level of capitalism. That's all. It was confused, but I'm sorry, now I expose myself like Jesus Christ to the evil <laughs> judges to attack me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let me say on behalf of myself and uh, my fellow panelists, we did not know what Slavoj Žižek was going to say tonight. <laughs> uh, and again, I don't know whether this is him. true. This is for... how he greeted me. What will you say? You just want to talk without telling us, you know. <laughs> Sorry. It wasn't an accusation. I love to hear you talk about whatever. I just didn't know what it was going to be. And I'm not stupid enough to think that I'm capable of responding to Slavoj Žižek on the fly, right? <laughs> not a good idea. Um, however, I'm feeling a little bit stupid now because what I wrote down bears almost no relation to what he just said. Um, with then you are like Obama responding <laughs> Romney in the first debate. Go on. <laughs> no. I, I'm going to try to be a little livelier okay. than that, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, right. So, um, 
it'll sound a little bit weird, especially because I believe I agreed with every everything that Slavoj just said, uh, which is, however, not exactly the same thing as what he says in his book, which I highly recommend, but is a little different. So uh, this is the written out part. One reason why I'm glad of the existence of Slavoj Žižek is because he's taken on the project of refashioning common sense. Refashioning common sense is a project that we in the academy are often content to defer indefinitely if we recognize it at all, and this even though it offers the most plausible answer to the question of why we do, why what we do is ultimately worth doing, if indeed it is ultimately worth doing. Another reason why I'm glad of the existence of Slavoj Žižek is because he addresses himself to common sense in the name of Hegel, which is quite a trick. <laughs> in order to do this, he plays down the Fukuyama end of history Hegel in favor of a Hegel who teaches us to look at the messiness of the present dialectically, which is to say neither condemning it moralistically on the one hand, nor on the other hand, missing the signs that the present can and will turn into something very different. A third reason why I'm really glad of the existence of Savoy Zizek <laughs> is that he speaks unapologetically in the name of secularism and universalism, and it takes some courage to do that these days. Uh, a fourth reason why I'm glad of his existence is that for him, the name of the, the problem, the problem, is capitalism, something that needs saying, uh, yet also because he says it in a Hegelian or dialectical spirit that allows us to see some unexpected possibilities and even virtues in it. For all its recent unsteadiness, capitalism does not seem ready to disappear anytime soon. And for someone who takes it as the problem, it's therefore tempting to judge ordinary politics to be more or less trivial and unworthy of our time and effort. I think, and this really is a reference to the book and not to what you just heard, that Slavoj sometimes succumbs to that temptation, a temptation that, in what you just heard, is kind of pushed mm -hmm. off onto Balibar, Rancière, and Badiou. Since a respondent cannot just bless the speaker's existence, but must also perform his function of responding, this is what I'll use my time to bother Slavoj about. In my own view, capitalism has to be named as the problem and fought without thereby discrediting ordinary politics and even the existing institutions that, if you look, you will see are the result of past political conflicts. And even if those institutions clearly do, among other kinds of work, the work of maintaining capitalism. This seems to me a properly Hegelian position and even Slavoj Žižek's own position um, though in the book he doesn't really say so. What he says about politics in the year of dreaming dangerously is ambivalent, perhaps as is perhaps inevitable for someone reporting on Occupy and speaking on, be on behalf of revolution. I'm ambivalent about politics myself, but not quite as ambivalent as he is. And in this election season, I worry that any category that's as comfortably postponed as revolution will sound cool to people in part because it doesn't demand that they get up off their behinds right now and do something. I'm pretty sure that slogans like communism and the dictatorship of the proletariat are not going to get anyone around here to campaign against Mitt Romney. I'll bet you $10,000. <laughs> I raised to 20. Okay. <laughs> In his discussion of Greece and Italy, Slavoj notes that politicians in those countries have been replaced by depoliticized technocrats, and that things there and elsewhere are moving toward the suspension of political democracy. It seems very clear he thinks this is a bad thing, and that political democracy in these countries is worth defending. Elsewhere in the book, however, he seems equally convinced that political democracy is not worth defending that it's just a distraction. I quote, Badiou hit the mark with his apparently weird claim, today the enemy is not called empire or capital, it's called democracy. So this is Slavoj again. It's the democratic illusion, the acceptance of democratic procedures as the sole framework for any possible change that blocks any radical transformation 
of capitalist relations. So this seems to me a little disingenuous. Who believes that existing political institutions offer the sole framework for change? I don't think I've ever heard such a thing, certainly not from anyone who cares about transforming capitalist relations. On the other hand, calling democracy the enemy, as Badiou does, and note democracy rather than capital, is a sort of cheap shot that almost seems intended to make people stay home, perhaps enjoying some bit of witty social commentary in their living rooms. It doesn't seem coincidental that the phrase dictatorship of the proletariat is resuscitated on the same page where Slavoj endorses Badiou's argument, I quote, against participation in democratic voting. Slavoj says that we do not get to vote on who owns what. This seems pretty plausible until you ask yourself whether it's actually true. Weren't we voting on who owns what when we voted in the graduated income tax? Isn't that what we would be voting on if we were to vote in, for example, a much higher tax on capital gains, or a tax on financial transactions, or a 100% inheritance tax, or if we were to reinstitute a decent welfare system. Speaking of which, should we really be indifferent to the ongoing dismantling of the welfare state? This dismantling, Slavoj says in the book, is not the, the betrayal of a noble idea, but, quote, a failure that retroactively enables us to discern a fatal flaw of the very notion of the welfare state. What's the fatal flaw? The idea that capitalism can be made, quote, socially responsible. I think this is wrong, not because I'm sure that capitalism can be made socially responsible, but because it's entirely about ideas. The dismantling of the welfare state is worth fighting not because the welfare state was or is a noble idea, but because people's lives are being wrecked these days by the withdrawal of social services. Better to be agnostic about the fate of capitalism in the long term, who can responsibly say that they really know for sure? In the meantime, and the meantime is where we live, in a state of uncertainty about the future, in which we're obliged to make our choices, nationally and globally, all we need is the assurance that some political efforts do have results, even when the idea behind them is not the noblest one one could conceive. The motto, fail again, fail better, is exact. Some failures really are better than other failures, and the welfare state is one of them. Was the manifesto of the Spanish indignados really mistaken in demanding a right to housing, health, education, and unemployment, that Canadian stuff that was referred to. <laughs> Did this really confer too much legitimacy on the state? In his analysis of populist anti-statism in the US, Slavoj says very correctly, I quote, large corporations are delighted at evangelical attacks on the state. When the state tries to regulate media mergers, put restrictions on energy companies, strengthen air pollution regulations, protect wildlife, and limit logging in the national parks, etc., etc. He doesn't seem to draw any conclusions from these state activities, either about the progressive politics that led to them because they weren't gonna come about without a push from progressive politics. Um, that seems to me a non-negligible success story. Or about the possibility that more pressure from the left could lead to further state intervention in the market, which is to say, more success. On the contrary, he makes such goals seem not worth bothering about. Not all the time, but often enough for it to be worth mentioning. At its most extreme, this becomes the imperative to abstain from acts of resistance on the grounds that acts of resistance, quote, only keep the system alive. Okay, acts of resistance only keep the system alive. This sounds cleverly counterintuitive, but I would really need to see some evidence that it's true 
before I let it decide how I'm going to conduct myself. I would not like to see it take over our common sense, and I don't really think Slavoj would either. Thanks. I've spent the past two days uh, reading and thinking about this book. And what is this book about? Uh, like many of us, Zizek is trying to make sense of the current global economic crisis and the, and the state of capitalism itself. But he's impatient, as you have heard, with the liberal proposals of government regulations or financial reform, or their attachment to the idea of the welfare state. By the same token, he's also impatient, um, and he rejects the moralizing diamond of greed, excess, corruption, and any kind of arguments made on behalf of human nature. The question that he puts to us in this book is this. Is our playing with the capitalist beast really the only imaginable game in town? The answer is no. Why? because the capitalist system can no longer find an imminent level of self-regulated st regulated stability and its circuit threatens to run out of control. Right? This is a, a, a Marxist position. Our task then is to begin by identifying the real game, that is to relearn what politics is, to re-identify, to reconceptualize the political in our time. To do that, Zizek wants us to rethink the notion of class struggle, which he argues, quote, stands for the irreducible political moment at the very heart of the economic. He's rethinking the relationship between the political and the economic. For him, although he doesn't really emphasize this in his uh, presentation, class struggle is not the ultimate reference and the horizon of meaning of all other social struggles, as it was for classic Marxism. Um, he made it very clear today that he's not, there's no going back to the earlier Marxist moment. What then is his idea of class struggle? He says it's the structuring principle that allows us to account for the inconsistent plurality of the ways in which other kinds of antagonisms uh, can be articulated into chains of equivalences. This is a very interesting idea that we really have to um, change gear in, in our thinking about the social picture. Here, Zizek introduces an important distinction between the logic of antagonism and the logic of recognition of difference. Just as he refuses to play the game of difference and cultural relativism, Zizek refuses to let himself get caught up in the liberal dilemma of how much tolerance can we afford in the multicultural and globalized world. Instead, he suggests that the only way out is to resuscitate the legacy of radical and universal emancipation, namely, do not simply respect others, but offer them a common struggle. Since our most pressing problems today are the problems that we have in common. One of the best historical examples I can think of, there are many, not many such struggles, is the international brigades from 53 countries during the Spanish Civil War, where all of a sudden people became colorblind when they fought fascism side by side. Last fall, Zizek gave a speech at the Zuccotti Park during the Occupy Wall Street movement. Parts of that speech um, have been incorporated in, into one of the book chapters called the Occupy Wall Street, or the violent silencing of a new beginning. That's the, that's the chapter title. In this chapter, he defends the movement against a number of familiar charges, such as, oh, do, the people, do these people have a program? Or do they have a vision? And, and so on and so forth. Um, and he points out two important aspects of this movement. One, 
The contemporary popular discontent is with capitalism as a system, not with any particular corrupt form of the system. Two, the contemporary form of representative multi-party democracy is incapable of dealing with capitalist excesses. In other words, democracy has to be reinvented. That's the language that, that he uses in the book. Um, now, this is a genuine problem uh, for reflection on, for theoretical innovation, um, <coughs> but it has been strangely perverted by uh, a number of, uh, by, by the media and by uh, uh, a number of theorists. Um, in this chapter, Zizek analyzes uh, a, a, a discussion of how globalization uh, uh, has uh, destroyed democracy. And it's one of those perversions that he highlights for us. Now, those people who see a connection between globalization and the weakening of democracy seem to turn a blind eye to the logic of capitalism when they, for example, claim, quote, globalization has begun to undermine the legitimacy of Western democracy. This sounds a bit strange. Okay, so it, 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 it sounds like a threat is coming from the outside. The question is, is it simply another way of saying that the United States is an empire in decline? Now, these are not equivalent statements, but they seem to imply each other. That leads to the second point I wanted to bring up. I've, I've, although I found many of Zizek's reflections extremely interesting and insight, insightful, I would, however, push his psychoanalytical diagnosis of capitalism in a somewhat different direction. I, I would probably not uh, uh, put it in the Lacanian reel where Zizek locates locates the problem, but in the symbolic order where capitalism truly thrives. And I will conclude here. Now, my question is uh, what do we make of the changing situation of the dollar? That's really the realm of the symbolic uh, for capitalism and the American financial dominance in the world. And earlier you were speaking about using the states. Now, are some states using themselves? I'll give you an example. At the fourth BRICS summit in New Delhi, that was last spring perhaps, the uh, member countries agreed to work towards currency swaps when trading among themselves. The quantitative easing since the 2008 financial crisis has made many countries vulnerable. And they realize uh, there's this immense risk involved in holding the dollar. For China, there's a general trend, according to uh, analysts, uh, there's a general trend in recent years to internationalize the, the RMB or yuan. At the end of last year, 9% uh, of China's total trade was settled in yuan, not in dollar, with 14 countries and regions. And this was a, a huge jump up from 2010, where the percentage was only 0.7%. Um, a report by HSBC in 2010 estimated half of China's trade with emerging market countries by 2015 would be conducted using currency swaps. In other words, the report went on, quote, nearly two trillion US dollars worth of trade, trade flows could be settled in RMB annually, making it one of the top three global trading currencies. The end of quote. It is important to notice that the world's second and third largest economies, China and Japan, announced their currency swap agreement uh, a number of, uh, some months ago, less than a year ago. Um, and that agreement was to take effect in June this year. Took effect, it took effect in June this year. 
One analyst says that this swap is, more, is one more nail in the coffin of the dollar as the international reserve currency. What does it mean then? What it means is that countries like China and Japan would stop paying their annual tribute to the imperial center, like being forced to buy bonds. What would happen to the master discourse, uh, back to the Lacanian language? What is the political implication here? How would the US defend the dollar? Now finally, would the US go to war or proxy wars to defend the hegemony, hegemony of the dollar at all costs? So I wanted to put these questions to you. Maybe you have already thought about these questions. Thank you. Now uh, you will, you know in Hollywood films when the good guy is beaten and already lays down, <laughs> lying down, a bad guy comes and adds this, the last kick right. into the head, <laughs> you know. That's that's your, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, well I haven't prepared any comments because I'm a lazy Greek. <laughs> Uh, well, actually, I knew that uh, Slava would, uh, would never be able to anticipate what he would say, so I didn't uh, uh, think it would be wise to prepare comments. Uh, however, I, I did uh, uh, read this book, and uh, there are, there's a lot, a lot of uh, things in it that I find provocative. There are various things I disagree with. This, you know, in some ways, not unusual. I would like to address some of the things that Slavoj said, actually, uh, here, uh, also in reference to the book. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you will see, I, and perhaps not surprisingly, our comments echo each, each other. Uh, first of all, I should say, just unequivocally, uh, what I share uh, with Slavoj, I, I, I share uh, his uh, uh, uncompromising critique of liberalism and uh, a representative democracy. I think that the world that we live in today shows uh, the, the bankruptcy uh, of this uh, road. Um, the bankruptcy here is a kind of okay. interesting word. With what would you replace it? How? We'll, what get, does to this we'll get to okay, okay. We'll get to exactly that. Um, I definitely share his uh, critique of uh, a certain kind of postmodern depoliticization, uh, uh, which is also linked to a, a certain kind of, uh, you know, consumerist uh, uh, atomization uh, and, and, of course, uh, in that sense, incapacitation of the people's will. Uh, in order to, 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 of course, defend what they have. Uh, no doubt, and I think that's, that's something we probably, uh, many of us share here, is the desire for a new radical imagination, the most difficult uh, thing, but the, we share the desire. And finally, uh, uh, the, I, I do share his commitment to troubling uh, categories uh, to a certain kind of, perhaps a certain kind of epistemological anarchy, which is literally troubling, uh, and, 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 and both in terms of, uh, in, in also in, in relation to a certain kind of difficulty uh, in responding. Now, um, there are three pairs that are, that are for me, crucial uh, here that we need to uh, deal with. One is something that has already been discussed, uh, uh, is that the, the relation, I'm not gonna say antagonism, um, so as not to fall into a La cloud thing, uh, between capitalism and democracy. Uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, capitalism and democracy are quintessentially incompatible, and they've always been so. Uh, and the fact that they may seem to uh, go together is itself a certain kind of ideological, I'm using shorthand language, we can uh, obviously tease ideological, uh, um, a process uh, in which, of course, what we call liberalism uh, has played the greatest hand. Liberalism <coughs> is the most glorious attempt to create an adherence between two uh, um, uh, domains, I don't know what to call them, that are structure, structurally incompatible. Uh, and we are living in the, t in the times of undoing, as, as Slavoj said, where this incompatibility, which I think I repeat is structural, it has never been more evident. Okay, the second thing is the relation between uh, dogma and, and doxa. Uh, um, uh, and uh, I understand very, very well why uh, 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 Slavoj in, in some ways is teasing us here and provo provoking us to think dogmatically. I understand his frustration 
uh, with um, the fact that uh, the sort of the endless deliberation or in a in a kind of uh, uh, parliament of opinion, all right, uh, where things can go on, we can discuss every little thing uh, at length and not, in fact, make a decision uh, about it. I think that is, uh, uh, I mean, his, his frustration is, is, I share his frustration. Uh, but my argument would be that um, the, that the gravity of decision uh, is e even greater and in many ways more radical when, in fact, this chaotic uh, um, circulation and contention of opinion uh, is, is in play. Uh, and that when you introduce dogma as a kind of uh, principle uh, that authorizes what you say, you, in fact, open the door for, uh, uh, for the defeat of democracy in the way, of course, I've argued in the first pair. Uh, I, I, I remind you that the, very, the concept orthodoxy uh, is actually a contradiction in terms. There can never be a correct doxa. There can never actually be a position, uh, uh, um, an, an opinion. An opinion here is not just some kind of light thing. Okay? An opinion is a commitment to a position. It is, in fact, a decision. There can never be a decision that is correct in and of itself. It is always something that takes place in the field of contention. Uh, and in this respect, uh, it is essential to any democratic thinking. The third pair um, is uh, one um, that I, I consider to be a false dilemma. It has been really a, a, a kind of a haunting thing to certainly the Marxist tradition. And that is the, uh, the, the what is, been, is seen as antagonistic pair between revolution and reform. Um, and my argument would be that that is a false dilemma. Uh, and we understand uh, why it exists. We understand uh, what I its significance w was for a, uh, a Bolshevik critique of, 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 uh, of a, Leninist, uh, a Leninist critique of, of uh, social democracy and so on and so forth. But the argument would be that, um, in a sense, there can never be a revolution uh, that is a sort of tabula rasa position. Uh, um, I mean, that's a, a, a dream that uh, we can, of course, have a right to dream, uh, in, and indeed dream dangerously, but it can never be more than a dream, which is not to say that dreams are not materially important, etc. cetera. Uh, because even in the most radical uh, uh, moment, uh, radical revolutionary mo moment, something that, uh, the very thing that is annihilated, uh, it leaves a remainder, uh, which is something that is part of whatever is instituted next. This Lavoie is talking about it, has talked about at length in many of his books. Um, so that, in fact, um, uh, revolutionary is always a reforming uh, of, uh, it is an giving form to something, uh, another form to something that has previously existed. Now, I'm not suggesting, obviously, reform as any kind of tinkering or adjustment uh, of something that exists in the kind of a, uh, a way that a certain kind of liberal politics, a certain kind of managerial politics, actually, as, as Slavoj says correctly, uh, implies. I am arguing about radical politics. Radical politics is a politics of form. It, it engages, it's a po poetic pol politics. It's a politics of poesis, of creating form. And, there, and, and there's no way that form can be created uh, in the absence of, of forms, okay? Therefore, the, the dilemma of revolution and reform is, in fact, a false dilemma. Um, now, this is, so I'm obviously arguing, uh, remember the first one, capitalism versus democracy, obviously I'm arguing in favor of democracy. Um, Slavoj's work, and this is kind of uh, equivocal, because uh, he argues against democracy, sometimes for right reasons. Obviously, any concept of democracy that exists today is, deserves to be criticized. But that's part of the problem, the word is tainted. And one might be, it might be, uh, reasonable to say that democracy is no longer useful as a word, and we should just simply give it up. Uh, that's fine, so long as we invent uh, a word in its place that somehow taps at a certain radical meaning. Uh, communism could be that word, so long as, uh, as, it is, uh, as it is deprived of practically its entire history. Um, uh, and the only thing that we would be able to save would be of, uh, uh, the tradition of anarcho-syndicalism, a certain kind of workers' councils, uh, communism, but, and so on and so But forth. communists are now in power in many of the most successful capi capitalist systems today. Exactly. That's exactly. crucial. 
Therefore, communism. So they are not out. This is the revenge of history against Fukuyama. I told him the last time. <laughs> okay, you want capitalism, but ha ha! Look who is in power. We, the losers. Of this. Therefore, communism is a problematic name as well. So let's not play with names. Uh, let's. Uh, 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 but I, there is no doubt about the fact that that what he demands and what he he has in relation uh, to uh, also his experience in in in, uh, in Greek politics recently is actually uh, something that we share. Uh, uh, and, uh, the examples that he brought, the demand for a new and I was, left I was attacked by Communist Party, the hard of line, as the ultimate bourgeois revisionist <laughs> there. Of course you were. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, you know, the demand for a, for a new left gov governmentality, I, I, you can certainly throw out the word, I don't mean to be Foucauldian, but nonetheless, let's, again, I'm using this shorthand language, the left can no longer afford to remain in some kind of stable opposition, some kind of utopian opposition to whatever is the status quo, it does have to take uh, itself seriously and to be accountable for governing, to, to, to overcome it's the taboo on governing. It, I think the taboo on governing, yeah, yeah. governing is only, only the left has such a taboo. No other, uh, let's say, political position in the history of politics has had this this uh, taboo. And You're uh, anarcho-syndicalist yes, a little bit. Indeed, yeah. indeed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this obviously uh, will come out. Yeah. So uh, when um, Slavoj asks uh, correctly that we must uh, think, uh, uh, he's asking for a new kind of left imagination correctly, he's, sa he's saying will give us uh, uh, something that is new. The demand, of course, as he knows, is paradoxical. It's in fact an impossible demand. On the one hand, there has to be a demand because otherwise the left is defeated, it's caught in its own uh, uh, phantoms. At the same time, the demand is impossible in, insofar as it cannot actually have an answer. And he, he was very careful, he said, I don't want simple plans, one, two, three. But even uh, any kind of articulation uh, would uh, inevitably go back into the significations, in fact, that, but that Bruce brought, brought about. Meaning, um, just the same thing with revolutionary reform. Just like we cannot, in fact, say that the revolution is a tabula rasa uh, gesture, the same way that, that we cannot say that a new left imagination cannot, let's say, must be barred from uh, invoking uh, elements that are already in existence. So we are caught in a very difficult situation. The, the, uh, let's say in very concrete terms in Greece, pardon me for a second to use a concrete example. It's not one of those small things, but uh, um, the, the, uh, let's say uh, if uh, God, uh, as you said, uh, next time around uh, does his work and Syriza wins the elections, one of the first things that he would have to do, uh, one of the first things that he would have to do, very concrete uh, thing here, it would have to police uh, uh, what has been essentially a, a broad enemy throughout Greek society. And in order, in order to police uh, this great, great, great enemy, it has to purge the police of certain elements that actually keep it lawless, okay? Now this is a task of policing, and we don't get to into Ranskier here necessarily, but it is an act of policing, we forget Ranskier, uh, which is, it would have to be an, an element of uh, what we can call radical left governmentality. Uh, something that would raise all kinds of questions about what is this, uh, is this left reformist? Has it sold out? Uh, is, it, uh, uh, is it in fact compromised? Is it become bourgeois revisionist? Or, or what have you. Uh, so I think whatever answer is given to, to his correct demand for us to give answers uh, will inevitably uh, taint itself, dirty itself, uh, by having to uh, plunge into significations, political significations uh, that already exist. And that is the play of democracy. The play of democracy is dangerous, dirty, messy, and in fact uh, uncertain, and, uh, and, and uh, not, some, not, not in that sense a clean utopian uh, project. Uh, can I ask you a question and give you more time? You said at the beginning, when I interrupted you, I apologize sincerely, first time, when you said, yeah, yeah, beyond democracy, what? Then you said, when I asked him, but what comes instead of representative democracy? Oh, oh, it will come later. Fuck you, I didn't see. <laughs> Tell me. Where? Show me. Did, did you see anything? Again, you avoided the problem with police. You said, ah, we have to purge the police. Yes, with another strong police. No. Yes, the only uh, way. That's what I had a long debate with, with uh, who is the guy? Uh, uh, my God, Tsipras. I told him, are you aware? 
capital will try, if you win, capital will try to leave the country and so on. You will need a very strong police apparatus. Now, I explained to him, of course, this doesn't mean we need the greatest genius of 20th century, Comrade Stalin. But this is a challenge. How to do it in a non-Stalinist way? Well, that's, you're not, you're, so you're not disagreeing with me. I'm, no, I said, no, I, no. I, said, I, 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 I just would like a hint. Yes. You said so well, emphatically, I mean, uh, Slavoj, it is, will come is, later. Uh, well, that's what, what? I'm saying. Well, it is a certain kind of anarcho-syndicalism. How? I mean, in, How? in, uh, in Barcelona. He is in power. What would you do? Well, I said the very first thing would be uh, to uh, create a certain kind of lawful society, Cow. right? By purging police. By pur purging police of fascist elements. And, and policing. And? and policing. Creating a, 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 a good in, police. We Why will not? have to say that. I mean, from a certain standpoint. Why don't you want that. to say yeah, that? Yeah, uh, Why don't you want to say that? An extremely strong, <laughs> even expanded police will be needed. Why are you afraid to say this? I'm not afraid to say that. I, I, I said it. The, the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> now you sound like Obama avoiding <laughs> Romney. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I am against dogma, so my position will change very rapidly in the course of a conversation. <laughs> ah, uh, I, know, I, know, I know where you will end. You know what Stalin said when he was accused? You communists are for withering away of the state, but my God, look your police apparatus. And Stalin said, you don't get it. The dialectic is that Paradoxically, Stalin said this, the state is withering away through the very strengthening of its apparatuses, especially apparatuses of repression. No. Yeah, but that's, that's the worst kind of a Hegelian dream. I mean, you know that. There's no, the, no, the quite police, serious. Uh, no, but the listen, le the I, listen, is still running, let me uh, apologize. Let me apologize. <laughs> it's, but nonetheless, I hope you see it. It's not a joke what I'm talking about. Syriza, if they were to win power, they would have to do something. Yes, what? Well, not only that, one, one police, of the other things that they would have to do is... What? My God, don't avoid the problem. No, no, we said that. I mean, that the, the no. first, that's why I said... What did you say? Uh, uh, that's why the first thing I said was the police. I mean, think about that. I mean, when I've said that to my uh, friends yeah. uh, in Syriza... What do you I mean by same? police? A new, stronger Actually, police? Yes, absolutely. Okay, a, a police okay, that, would be able, okay. that would be able to uh, keep the fascists from running uh, around, yeah, yeah, doing whatever yeah, they yeah, want, yeah, yeah. that they, okay, would, they okay. would actually send yeah. to prison uh, all kinds of uh, corrupt, uh, uh, not just simply politicians, but basically corrupt people in all yeah. kinds of sectors yeah. of society, yeah. and so on and so forth. That, the point, though, is that, that, that for the left to act in this fashion is overcoming an extraordinary taboo. It is a kind of totally activity agree. Agree uh, more, that, yeah. that raises questions as to whether it still is, it still is the left, uh, which is something that is not, we can kind of go around here and have fun, but, but in, in real, in the world out there, in, in the political mm. sphere, this is, not a, this is not a simple thing. And, uh, okay. and, uh, and, and also, its results are not, at this point, uh, even conceivable. We don't really. Need, yeah, I mean, so we're talking about not just simply dreaming dangerously, but acting dangerously, and that is really what is democratic about it. That's uh, what I here. I am on Hegel's idea. side against Marx. I agree with you. Okay. We are right. making steps, yeah. and we cannot pretend that exactly. Exactly. from some high position we know even the consequences. I agree. Exactly. So anyway, the floor is still yours. No. So thanks. For, first, I must say <laughs> that. I'm pleasantly surprised by this debate, and I partially assume responsibility for criticism. Uh, I mean, re responsibility in the sense that you were right in pointing out some, because I agree that obviously, at least if you read this book immediately, there are what prima facie cannot but appear as inconsistencies. Like in the chapter on Occupy Wall Street, I defend the lack of program emphatically. I said, I use that metaphor which I like very much of boxing clinching, you know. Like, I remember Bill Clinton, who is the greatest clincher or whatever, no? You know what is clinching in boxing? When opponent can't beat you, he said, let's talk, embraces, you know, and on you. Immediately in the middle of Wall Street, you remember, Clinton came and said, guys, I'm with you, but please give us concrete proposals. What do you want? No. At this level, concrete proposals would have met to to use the bombastic, dogmatic terms, to speak the language of the enemy. You know, we need time. But at the same time, you know what's my problem? Let me now be very concrete, and now, not to talk too long, I will also try to connect this to answering you. I agree, this is a very important 
problem and process, BRICS, United States, and to be cynical but to be great bitterness, I think that every honest leftist should advocate, start to collect money to build a statue to George Bush the Younger. Because he succeeded in eight years, the real result of his politics was that to a large extent, the United States lost its hegemonic role. Look where are now. Super, super power, they cannot even control a shitty start Afghanistan and so on. I mean, <laughs> out. But, you know where I'm maybe, maybe have a different accent. Yes, I agree with the importance of how you describe this process. My bitter pessimism is just that Let's wait and see what this change means. We, is it really necessarily a change for the better? You know, like going back to Greece, I'm now I hopefully not saying a state secret, that I asked Tsipras the obvious question. Now that you are in conflict with Europe, which he wasn't, Tsipras is not an idiot, he kn knows very well. Greece cannot play these games, the proud nation state alone. I asked him the obvious question. How about the other guys? I meant, of course, Russia, China. Mm -hmm. Did they come to you, offering to you? And he told me a pretty sad story. A, China. Do you know that the Chinese half a year ago or when, you must know the story, yes. bought the port of Piraeus in a way which was so brutal that no honest racist imp Western imperialist would be ready to do it. They fired half of the people, they changed some rules so that they cannot, the remaining workers even build a trade union and so on. So one of the consequences of this is that with my great sincere, I'm not bluffing here, admiration of China, one of the consequences of this poetic new multicentric world, blah, blah, is that we should also start to talk about, let us say, Chinese economic uh, colonialism. What is China doing in Myanmar? What is China doing, for example, did you read this? You don't see it a lot in the newspapers. Two, three months ago, there was a big scandal, but underreported with us in Zambia. Uh, in a mine owned by a Chinese company, local workers rebelled and killed two Chinese managers. The problem was this one. Uh, Zambia has a law that minimum monthly wage is 230 for the whole month, of course, dollars. The Chinese owners of the mine, although they promised when buying the mine that they will provide local jobs, were not ready to pay such a high salary, so they started to import poor Chinese workers who are ready to work for $150 per month, this caused tension. Not to mention, again, Myanmar, Sudan, and so on and so on. I'm far from blaming China as worse than Western imperialism and so on and so on. I'm just saying, you know, like, it's not even the guilt of China. China is a new superpower. This is very sad what I will say, but almost has to engage in some kind of economic colonialism, you know. So again, not to mention China, Russia, this was the saddest story. Uh, 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 Tsipras told me that, okay, Chinese didn't show any big interest, but Russians did. A delegation came from Putin and they told him, yes, we can give you great amounts of money to save you from bankruptcy if, if Euro withdraws Brussels, no? But the price is, and then the Russians gave him a precise list of those companies, telecom or what, where still money clings, no? Plus, what you can expect, even Tsipras was shocked, one big Greek island as a permanent military base. So, you know, that's the reality. Let's not go don't you agree, into too much poetry about this multicentric world with American imperialism sidelined. Yes, but you know, it's not that American imperialism is good. I'm just a total pessimist here. If somebody is bad, his opponent is not, unfortunately, automatically good, how should I put it, you know? So again, uh, I would just say that I agree with your description of the process. I agree what you mentioned with how 
I described the process. It was, how is it called, that your guy, economist, whom I quote? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, This, like, yeah. that we are really in a kind of a neo-Spartan system more than Rome, where the whole world no, was basically, Minnesota. yeah, was basically financing the United States by minimum one, one billion dollars daily of income. But who knows what will <laughs> the new world be? Uh, what, uh, now to the beginning, I, uh, I agree with... Uh, Practically all what you said, I don't know if I used it in the book. This was a very quickly composed book, but uh, I agree, no, I, and I agree with you, this reform revolution. You know what? I will now give you an example which I hope you will all like from my own youth. Well, I'm not saying I was a mega dissident, but mid-level, like enough, <laughs> to be, enough to be jobless, not enough to be arrested, to put it in brutal terms. No? And I remember how, for example, in the last years of communism, those were not stupid communists in power. So if you provided a radical critique of the system, communism worse than fascism, well, Marx ultra terrible, no problem. There was a dissident as a profession in some liberal communist countries like Yugoslavia, Hungary. The deal was what? Say theoretically, who cares, all that you want. Just don't mess too much in detail with concrete. That was the deal. You were allowed to be a professional dissident. Go to the West explaining how communism is the greatest. All that uh, uh, Ernst Nolte stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Nazism is just a reaction of communism the, uh, the, uh, to com blah, blah. But, for example, don't ask to change that specific law which punishes the, the, uh, the lead opinion, opinion or whatever. You know, like in such a situation, to forget about big radical demands, but to ask just why did you change a little bit the penal law which regulates was a much more radical measure right, exactly. than big demands or whatever. And at this, now it will surprise you, I don't know what is in the book, what is not. Uh, uh, but uh, in this way, I agree with you, uh, Bruce, when you mentioned Obama. I know it's so fashionable by those who consider themselves relatively radical left in the United States to, if I may express myself plastically, to, to screw Obama from all positions, no? <laughs> Disappointment, blah, blah. And I don't agree with them. Like uh, uh, Tariq Ali, published a book with proto-racist title like Obama, you take the mask off, you know, all that bullshit. Listen, that book is so shitty, it's written, as, what did he expect? That yeah. Obama will introduce uh, communism here or what? <laughs> I, I know that healthcare reform ended up as an incredible, uh, uh, too much compromise, blah, blah. But listen, I'm not ready to, to stop praising Obama for this was such an important ideological operation, critical. The whole debate about health care, which did target the very core of what I call standard American ideology, this mystified notion of freedom of choice. What Americans in this Republican version tend to forget is that, okay, freedom of choice is a nice thing, but are we aware that in order to have in today's complex society actual freedom of choice, you need an incredibly complex state apparatus, ethical rules, and so on and so on. Like to be vulgar, freedom of choice means I can take a walk on Broadway and go to this movie or to that restaurant. This means I can count on a certain efficiency of police, I can count on certain politeness of people, and so on and so on. So here again, I think that no wonder that Obama still is such an incredibly traumatic point for American right. You know, all those mad points which are symptomatic for me, like, you know, like, I think over 30% of, of American think that Obama is secretly a Muslim or whatever. This is an, an indication. So no, I... You know, Peter Holbert already made this critique of me. He said, I oscillate between three positions. A, waiting some big bloody revolution. B, Bartleby doing nothing. C, modest measures. My idea is, why choose? 
There are yeah, definitely, no, no, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are moments when one has to be pragmatic. There are moments when you fight Hitler where you don't say negotiation. No, either he's dead or we die to Hitler. And there are moments where, where the whole field is so mystified. And I can give you examples, not the traditional one. For example, when you have the whole country caught in some pseudo-patriotic fervor. At that point, you can only withdraw, and your silence will be noted. You know, so this is not a choice. So to go on very quickly. So yes, you need I to get some questions from the. Yeah, no, no, very quickly, very briefly. Uh, democracy. Again, yes, I may appear inconsistent, but as you did, all I'm saying is this. Hey, of course, as far as we can save it, I'm not crazy, and I'm involved in fights in Europe. Believe it or not, we are now, I am tired of simple America bashing, you know, we civilized Europeans come here. What is happening now in Europe with this terrifying reform of the entire education system, subordinating all academia to factories for experts, for those in power, all that stuff. We have to fight all of it. I just claim two things. That uh, when, listen, crucially in the book, if there are a couple of pages that are, I prefer, remember those pages where I engage in a dialogue with Anne Applebaum, mm. who on the one hand agrees today's democracy, the way we have it institutionally, it's simply not strong enough to cope with uh, 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 international capital and so on and so on. That's all I'm saying, in this sense only I made. I'm ironic there. I even, I don't agree with but you, if you remember correctly, I, but you is totally against participation no, in absolutely. any election. Yeah. I think this is That's madness. I think that even if we accept, which is really maybe too much for me, that most of the elections are pseudo-elections, are like, will you drink a Coke or Pepsi or, you know. <laughs> but from time to time, there are elections which matter. And it's madness to miss, uh, to, miss, uh, to miss those elections. So, you know what's only my point, but we are all coming to this. I hope, if I were to be a believer, which in contrast to some Orthodox Greeks, as I suspect you, I am not. Uh, uh, I would say I'm praying for, let's say, what I'm afraid of is the, the demise of welfare state. I wonder to what extent it's simply the politics of, of some bad conservatives which can be undone with social democratic or whatever victory, or to what extent it is a stronger tendency inscribed in global capitalist trends. I think that this attempt to, let's uh, return to it, uh, as to resistance when you, no, 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 Re this is, I know, uh, Immediately I stop. <laughs> Big problem with the guy whose name I don't want to pronounce, who wrote the book Infinitely Demanding, and to whom I prefer to refer to as Voldemar is referred to in Harry Potter, those who, the one whose name should not be pronounced, no? The name is she and she, no? You know, uh, here we agree. What, resist, I oppose resistance if it means what you said, this comfortable left, we don't want to dirty our hands. We have only in this way I'm against resistance. We went through that, what you said, capitalism, democracy, incompatible. A, it's not so simple. Even Marx has shown that nonetheless, the only democracy which falls and formal as it is in the long term, functioned more or less with all limitation wasn't nonetheless the democracy engendered by capitalism. Show me any other system of democracy with not those enthusiastic two months where workers' councils were in power, but so I agree with you there is incompatibility now. It was uh, dogma. You know, we play with words here. I am not using dogma in the sense of central committee says women should not be raped or what. I mean dogma in a much more positive sense of this, how should I put it, uh, things which are so clear to you that you don't even find it worthy debating them. And I don't think, yes, we should have doxa doxa, but if somebody tells me, sorry, fighting racism, the equality of blacks is not a doxa. It should be, we don't debate it. I tend to 
agree with it. And false dilemma, revolution, reform, we I agree with you. I agree our. with you. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, thank you, Savoy. Uh, I, I think that the safest to take uh, two or three questions, three questions, be, and, and then uh, Savoy can answer them all uh, because you know likelihood. In the will spirit be of democratic socialism, uh, centralism, did you distribute questions? And now <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're all be, planted. They're all planted. They're planted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been approved by. I'm me. just worried that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Please. Yeah. My name is uh, Raymond Lada. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hi, my name is Raymond Lada. I'm a political economist and advocate for Baba Vakian's new synthesis of communism. I want to address a brief Please. comment and question to Slavoj Žižek. It is true that the world is a horror, but it is not true, as you allege, that the first wave of socialist revolutions, especially Maoist China, was a failure. And it is wrong, it is harmful, and it is unconscionable that you are seeking to use your stature to try to close the door on the way out of this horror and madness, which is Avakian's new synthesis of communism and its strategy for revolution. Now, in print and in several public forums, I have challenged you to a debate about the history and prospects for communist revolution. Nothing could be more important. This is about the future of humanity, the emancipation mm. of humanity. So my question to you, Slavoj, is why have you refused to have this debate and can we here, right here and now, decide on a time and place to have this crucial debate? <laughs> no, uh, that's okay, let's, let's get the next person. No, but, no. You, you can get to it, actually. Let's get it. Let's okay, okay, but I will definitely yeah, answer. Yeah. Okay, please, yeah. please, yeah. Oh, I see, sorry. We'll go that way. That's the, the yeah, it's a false democratic solution. Uh, At least you started with the left side. So <laughs> <on the left, laughs> so. You know, this question you raised about, uh, you know, the whole alliance between uh, capitalism and democracy, do you think it was largely possible because, you know, of colonies in the first, you know, which created this excess wealth for Europe and North America and later the economic domination where it went on for about 50, 60 years? And do you think for Europe to sustain all, uh, its welfare state now, it really has to radically change its structure. I mean, with the present structure of capitalism, with colonies, with no colonies, with you know, economic domination waning, that structure has to change from within to actually preserve those equal rights that you talk about, where you should, you know, that we should preserve as dogmas. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I had a question. I'm also a very upset person. Um, and I have a question. Why, uh, I read this book and, and then you were talking about uh, sociopathy, love, uh, and about the event, and I was wondering uh, those kind of solutions besides from communism that you spoke about, their relation for me can be only established through psychoanalysis. And um, you know, I'm wondering what's your take on establishing relation, for example, between event and sociopathy and love, uh, besides from theological, you know, way. Thank you. Uh, this, okay, can I briefly? Yeah, yeah. First, absolutely. the last one. This, my answer here may surprise you, but I'm, as a dogmatic Lacanian, I'm almost opposed to too much, too quickly, too quick reference to psychoanalysis. I, you know what I gave agree. me this idea, <laughs> yeah, uh, that uh, I noticed how, on the, in contrast to the common opinion that Marxists didn't... Uh, tolerate psychoanalysis, it's much more complex. The first uh, kindergarten psychoanalytic in the world, you know who did it? Kira Knightley, that is to say, Sabine Spielrein, <laughs> after the film ends in Kremlin, in Kremlin, in 22 or 3, for nomenclatura. This is why then Trotsky wrote an open letter to Pavlov, anti-Bolshevik, to arousing him a more merciful attitude towards <laughs> psychoanalysis. No, you know what, where I just don't agree, and I hope we all agree here, with uh, praising, putting too much hope into psychoanalysis. You know why traditional Marxists like psychoanalysis? Because they have a certain simplistic vision. Capitalism crisis, working class will arouse, and so on. And then this doesn't happen, and instead of questioning their socio-economic analysis, they say, oh, this is because of ideological manipulations, psychoanalysis can explain this, you know, like, they put the blame on psychoanalysis, no, this here, again, 
I see the problem. And I don't see in, you know, this is very complex question that you started now. We don't have now time to go into it. Because, for example, in psychoanalytic terms, no, I have here a slight disagreement with my otherwise good friend, uh, Alain Badiou, who recently, in a book co-published by Elizabeth, her name should not be pronounced, no, uh, advocated, celebrated the discourse of the master. He says, I was quite shocked, literally, that we remain, you know, but you speak dismissively, human animals, liberal utilitarians, for a human animal to become truly a subject dedicated to a human cause, you need a master. Well, I think if this is the conclusion, then we can close our stores yes, yes. and become yes. cynical liberal realists, you know. Because from here, there is only one step to what Jacqueline Miller now advocates that the Lacanian, a pseudo Lacanian position that social authority is an imposture, illusion, but we should cynically learn that appearances shouldn't be too much disturbed because then things get even worse, you know like the same disgusting lecture as of the film that I like, because precisely it's disgusting film, so contradictory, uh, Batman, Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> what I like is that it imagines the impossible, people's power on Manhattan. But how can the film imagine it? It's deeply uh, symptomatic. So again, this is too uh, uh, complex. Let's go to this, uh, sorry, what uh, uh, the colleague, comrade there said about uh, this uh, colony democracy, again, this was a very good, very complex question. I would say this, that maybe even more important than this uh, mar uh, sorry, divorce between democracy and capitalism is for me, I will just give you briefly my thesis, a very pessimist one, but there are clear signs. Till now, it at least appeared, although it was never true, that Marx was right when, you remember, Marx's vision of exploitation is within the formal frame of freedom in the bourgeois sense, no? That is to say, uh, you are a red worker, I am black capitalist, <laughs> I employ you, we are both formally free, but because you, lazy Greek, breed at ten children, you need money, so you have to work for me, blah, blah. Okay, I claim, now comes the more serious stuff, I claim that, isn't it that today, Capitalism, this is why I think we have all these new forms of what Agamben calls homo sacer, new forms of apartheid, apartheid and so on, that capitalism can less and less afford even what traditional Marxists called the standard bourgeois formal democracy. Mm -hmm. It more and right. more needs direct classification of some people as second-hand, second-class citizens and so on and so on. I, this is what I see as a, uh, as a dangerous tendency. Now, to the uh, first uh, uh, question. Uh, uh, it all depends on, on, uh, on, on what do you think as failure. I never said, first I admit, my God, everybody is attacking my, that afterward, even but you exploded to Mao, but my God, I basically praise their cultural revolution. Remember, I'm quoting fanatically, celebrating it. All I'm saying is that, like, uh, the, the fact that the way it ended now, I think it's too simple with Deng Xiaoping reforms and so on. It's too simple to read this for me as a betrayal of some authentic revolutionary moment. I think that here I'm more of a Hegelian, if you want. The fact that it ended the way it ended points to some weakness which had to be there from the very beginning. As to this debate, okay, I sincerely apologize because I'm at least not an open liar. I admit to you that I promised you a debate, was it about a year ago, I think. No? Yeah, we should have a debate. We will, we will. And I will tell you when I say this publicly here, so that I commit myself. We will, it's a duel. No, right we will be, I will be here for three weeks in April. In April we will have this debate. 
And I here commit myself to just don't bring, don't bring your gang to interrupt me. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. <laughs> you just make this gesture, which in my Stalinist experience means, but what can I do when people will spontaneously protest? <laughs> Okay, so I promise, I publicly say this. Uh, April, the first three weeks of April, I'm here. Uh, okay, uh, do you want to take some more We have about ten more minutes, uh, so a little less. But, but well, uh, okay. We sh I'm, I still can, yeah, okay. I can Let's manage. Let's take three, yeah. three questions, please, uh, please be, be uh, brief. Okay, uh, maybe I can just start with the first question. There's something that echoed with me that... For One a question per person. <laughs> yeah, but maybe he's a divided subject. Maybe he's a divided subject. <laughs> sorry, that, that sorry. For a lot of the, the world, a lot of the working people, the world really is a horror here. And I just wanted to put forward my interpretation of this and ask you if you think that's accurate, where I think it's like you were very more concrete about advocating a more revolutionary path for people to take, and the other comment, um, commentators advocated more of a reformist alternative. But overall, this was a... a panel very, uh, very, very um, focused on reform, on theory, and I look at the audience for very much an, an intellectual academic audience, and I see a real separation between the actual issues here, the experience of a lot of people in the world who actually have to deal, not just with being jobless and yeah. out of the academia, but really have no choice and very little, very little path. And I wanted to question the composition of everybody in the panel of being almost entrenched in a certain identity that really hesitates from really unifying with the more working class united language and practical approach to these issues here. I think that there's a dangerous separation that's reflective of our times here. And I want to ask you, if you what do you think about that? Do we do again first the three? Yeah. Um, so I, I tend to agree with, with a lot of your analyses, but on one, on one point, um, I think that we disagree. So I just wanted to hear some more about what you think yeah. about this. Um, apropos our elections, um, a, a lot of people on the left right now, not enough, uh, probably are, are saying that, that given that sort of uh, Obama is on a lot of points working against what you would call like public use of reason, like privatization, um, ex increased national security state, et cetera. Um, austerity, uh, i.e. undoing the gains of past struggle. So like in this scenario, what is the argument against um, the Bartleby choice, against like sort of visible um, dissent either as sort of abstention or voting third party, et cetera, as, the, as, a, as a route um, towards demystification of the field? Okay. Yes. Last question. Thank you. Uh, um, my question is about environmentalism, yeah. which might be considered an alternative way of thinking. And certainly, a lot of the people I spoke to at Occupy London mentioned environmentalism as their alternative vision, and one in which would seriously question the trajectory of capitalism. But on the other hand, the media has been reporting the uh, crisis in Europe as. Uh, actually negating the rather more, as they see it, sort of nebulous question of global warming. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Nice questions. Let me go uh, step by step. What you said about the first question, about uh, working class and so on. My God, I am deeply... Okay, I don't want to use this word in a pathetic way. I mean it very simply. Solidary with this. It's crucial, I know. I, all I'm saying is this, and I think this part where I go into this more in detail was deleted from the book at the beginning, that I agree, although he is not the greatest genius in economy, there are many things he doesn't know, he being Fred Jameson. But in one of his texts on Hegel, even he developed, no, on Capital, something interesting. He says that, yeah, that today we have, among other things, to redefine the notion of exploitation in the sense that to be exploited in the classical Marxist sense, you have a permanent job, but the extra profit is taken by, is at least in some countries, almost a privileged position. You know, so that the idea is that to be born in a country, which is so-called rogue country, to be, already, you know, there, are, there is an incredible amount of people today 
who, and that's the tragedy of Europe, which exploded in Greece, but we are all in Europe in the same feet. You have, for example, literally millions of young people, highly educated, who are becoming aware in advance that there is not a minimal chance for them to get jobs and so on. And I think that somehow all these, those who are out, rogue states, permanently unemployed and so on, have to be brought together in a wider definition of working class. Working class. This I see as the only way of avoiding, if we don't do this, we will get something very dangerous. That the core of the working class, which still exists, which can become the fascist working, proto-fascist working class oppo uh, opposing others and so on and so on. So again, that would be my first point. Second point, US elections. Again, yes, it's a good question and I don't have here an a priori dogmatic answer. Yes, when there is a false choice and there are many false choices, it is very important to demystify it. The problem is to what extent is such a demystification effective? Do we really do it? And more seriously, you know, like this was basically the reaction of communists in Germany in 1933. They are a monument to me. Like, who cares? Even better if Hitler wins, because at, in this case, this will totally, they use the term, demystify the situation. None of social democratic <laughs> bullshitters, now the situation is clear. We communists here, the Nazis there, at the end we will win. Well, to put it cynically, at the end Hitler did lose, but quite many things happened in between. <laughs> Environmentalism. Uh, I agree with you, but absolutely but with one catch, that nonetheless, in the same way that we all agreed that we should absolutely not fetishize democracy, even but you, maybe this in, may interest you, now became softer and changed his terminology and accepts there is something basically good in democracy. People get old and they get soft, you know. <laughs> uh, I told him, see you in Gulag and so on. But, uh, okay, but what I want to say is that, but environmentalism, you know, it's also still, how should I put it, such a, I hate this word, it's part of the jargon, postmodern of the 60s, floating signifier, you know. It can be used in, for example, do you know that some conservatives in Europe use environmentalism, as you know, we cannot afford welfare state, nature itself cannot uh, sustain it, and so on. So, you know, you have almost as many envir environmentalisms as you have political orientations. You can have a capitalist environmentalism, which has its minimal points. I violently disagree, but it's true that in at least some Stalinist communist countries, the environmental catastrophe was much worse. Look at East Germany and so on. You, so you can have capitalist uh, environmentalism which says, yes, it's a big problem, but we should use market mechanisms, taxation and so on. You can have conservative environmentalism. The scene is modernity. And it's interesting how mm -hmm. even with some leftists like Hugo Chavez, they fall too much into this trap. I quote him in another book where Chavez said, the catastrophe began in 17th century, who, who, and before there were golden times or what, <laughs> and that capitalism killed mother nature. You know what was my reaction? I was in Bolivia. My reaction was at least one good thing that capitalism did, you know, <laughs> because I think that all this mythology of mother nature is the most dangerous, sorry to use the Stalinist term, reactionary revision. <laughs> so you, you see what I mean. We uh, I am basically, of course, for linking environmental crisis to the necessity of, not simply necessity of capitalist expansion, but to what Marx detected very nicely as this almost pseudo-spiritual indifference of capitalism. Capitalist is, uh, capital turns around and it doesn't matter if we all die, what happens to work, blah, blah, you know, it's, Capitalism works as an abstraction. So I agree with this. But uh, uh, 
Uh, nonetheless, I think things are to be avoided. First, especially here, any return to some pre-modern harmony is madness. In the sense that we should nonetheless never forget how many environmental horrors were done or like took Iceland. How do you pronounce it? Iceland, Reykjavik, the stupid Iceland. Iceland. You know that when Norwegians came there in 7th century, it was one big forest. Now there are literally in whole Iceland just a couple of thousand trees all and the Spanish, uh, uh, are called Canary Island. And so, and I met, this was my lifetime experience, in Missoula, Montana, some 15 years ago, a, an Indian American. I consciously hate the term Native Americans <laughs> because these guys uh, 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 told me why. You know the joke, I'm sorry if I repeat it, but it's my favor. They told me, if you call us Native Americans, what does this mean? You are culture Americans and we are nature. And also they told me we much prefer Indians. At least our name is a monument to white men's stupidity, you know. <laughs> they, they thought they are in India, you know. No, and they told me, this was for me the genuine assertion. They told me, fuck you white people, you think you do some ecological damage. We Indians burn more forest and kill more buffaloes than you ever will do. No, they were not joking. The deep insight in this joke was that they were well aware of patronizing, patronizing racism in this pseudo, oh, you, you, Indians with a holistic attitude in harmony with nature. For us, we are Cartesian, we just exploit nature. You go out and, like, as uh, some white idiots like to say, a Native American does mining. But before he digs into the earth, he listens to what the earth has to tell <laughs> him. And only if he feels invited, he does it, you know. No, you, you know what I mean? So yes, I agree with you. But don't forget that envir environmentalism itself is a, is, a, is, a, uh, is a field of struggle. I think that the first rule of really radical environmentalism, as I said in some of my other, I agree with you, there are too many books, <laughs> where I said the first thesis of radical environmentalism should be nature doesn't exist. No, no, not in the sense of some Fichte, we just think it constructs, but in nature in this mystified sense of some harmony that then we bet humans with our hubris destroyed. You should really read a good Marxist Darwinist, Stephen Jay Gould, <laughs> who depicted in a wonderful way what a catastrophic shit nature was already before, and again, this doesn't mean, so fuck it, we can do whatever we want. No, it makes our struggle even more radical and dangerous because we don't have a stable maternal place to return to. That's the lesson. It's not we screwed it up and now, you know, we should listen. I always say that, that when there is a tornado, don't, as a, a, an obscurantist friend of mine told me, don't you hear in these sounds of tornado wind the cry of Mother Nature and our <laughs> raping it and so on, you know? Like, Mother Nature is a heavy bitch. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Slavoj, and thank you for coming. Thank you.